This is episode number 17 with Michelle Norris. Welcome to the Doc Fitness Podcast, where it's all about developing your mindset, training, and nutritional knowledge so you can lose body fat and build muscle effectively while still living a real life. I am your host, David O'Connor. Now let's get into the show. How are we keeping, guys? And a big welcome back to the Doc Fitness Podcast. And today I'm delighted to announce that we have our first ever female guest on the show, who is a longtime friend of mine, Michelle Norris. And today we're going to dive into where to get started when it kind of when it comes to starting for your first five, maybe K or maybe ten K, or just running in general. And then we might dive into Michelle's background in breast movement as well, and the importance of sports bras for ladies when it comes to training and running in general. Because that's something that kind of opened my eyes a little, and something that I I wasn't really clued in on. So I think there's some big takeaways for obviously the lady side of things when it comes to breast movement but obviously the first half of it is going to be brilliant for anybody who's kind of looking to either improve their running technique or stuff like that or if they just want to kind of take up a bit of running outside of resistance training because michelle has an undergrad in sport and exercise science she also has a phd in recreational runners training for their first half or full marathon and then as well with that she's a postdoctorate in breast movement so that's what i love about this not only that as well michelle actually strength trains herself she trains three or four times a week in the gym with weights um, she plays football she plays GA, she plays a bit of football she plays a bit of hurling and she's actually training for her first marathon to be done a week from this episode as well when it was recorded but I'm just going to welcome Michelle now because she's going to talk about that in a little bit more depth and hopefully you enjoy it so Michelle welcome to the podcast thank you very much and Michelle, I'm not sure if you know this, but the first thing that I do to kind of catch people on the spot is um, I ask you in 10 seconds or less, what is it that you do? Okay. Um, so I am a PhD, well, no, I'm a PhD graduate and a postdoc researcher currently in the research group Breast Health. I focus on women's health issues related to breasts and exercise and sport at the moment. Nice. And then, just, yeah, just... To, I think it was like seven seconds, not too bad. <laughs> and just to create a bit of context then, Michelle, for kind of the people like what we're, we're chatting on air just before we get into this is we're going to kind of base it around maybe somebody starting off from scratch and they want to get into a bit of running or maybe they have a 5K event or 10K event coming up and we'll, we will dive into that. But first, like, kind of what got you into this road? Like, where, where were you inspired to go down this road and kind of how have you got to where you are now, we'll say? Yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of background um, on myself. So I did a undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science in the University of Limerick. So I graduated out of there in 2012 and went straight into my PhD um, in biomechanics. So primarily the physics of the body and how we move in sport and exercise. Um, so my focus for my PhD was on recreational run- Runners, and primarily uh, those undertaking their first uh, half and full marathon because you know that they are just at a very high risk of injury and the dropout rate of those training for half and full marathons is massive. Um, so that's where my focus was on. I looked at uh, injury. I tracked people through marathons and half marathons see did they get injured, why they got injured and primarily looked at their lower limb biomechanics. Um, so after that, as I was finishing that, I got a job over here in the University of Portsmouth in the research group in breast health, which is a far jump from what I had done in my PhD. But I guess when we think of the body, um, what I looked at was the physics of the lower limbs. But when you apply, when you know the basic physics, you can apply that to anywhere in the body. And so that's what we've kind of done. We're just moving it to uh, women and breast movement in general. So that's a bit of background on how I got here to this very unique position that I'm in now at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and um, we probably will touch on that later on, but uh, first, yeah, like uh, first I suppose, Michelle, I'm going to create a bit of context and kind of where I'm coming from with this. So right now, this, the timing of this podcast is perfect because we're actually in the middle of getting our members here in the gym to sign up for some small little kind of runs and like mud run events that are coming up so they can add a bit more variety kind of not to be kind of focused on, you know, weight loss the whole time and training in the gym and to give them something that they can actually train out to the gym for as well so we have a lot of members that they'll say they start training with say resistance training three times a week and um, they're focused on they just want to lose some weight and tone up but then a few months down the line they want this goal we'll say or they want to try this out for themselves but they haven't a clue where to start they haven't they've never ran before they've never walked a five or maybe they've walked a bit like but they haven't ran a 5k we'll say before at least so i suppose where where would that person even start when it comes to starting for a 5k in the easiest way possible to kind of, I suppose, bear in mind that this person now as well, 
is absolutely terrified of the thoughts of doing it because th- they think that they can't. Where do they start? Um, yeah, great question because I guess it's what a lot of people are doing nowadays since running has become so popular. Um, first thing I would recommend is getting yourself a good um, program that leads up into your goal. So if your goal is to do a 5K or 5K race in eight weeks or six weeks or something, then sign up for that so that you have that goal at the end and then get yourself a good program. So what we know from the research and what we know from anecdotally from just talking to people is that um, injuries or why people don't end up meeting their goals tend to happen when people don't have a plan or don't stick to consistent running. So for something like a 5K, which is manageable for someone who doesn't do a lot of running or wants to start with a smaller goal, um, their, their runs should only be generally fairly short to begin with. So you're looking at doing a 1K jog or then in maybe a 2K run maybe two to three times a week, maximum four times a week. So it is very manageable. In terms of time, it's manageable because that shouldn't take that long or shouldn't take away from your day too much. Um, And that you could be fairly consistent and keep that up. So what we know is that people get injured when they do um, a lot of running one week and then don't do any running the next week and then go back to a lot of running the week after, which happens a lot because obviously life gets in the way. Um, So if you're starting out, what you need to do is Set yourself the goal, get yourself a good program, and then just try and stick with it because that's the way you're going to actually meet your goal and not get injured along the way. Because it is a huge factor, and I think it scares people a lot, obviously, um, is that they don't think they'll be able to do it and that they think they'll get injured before they get to do it. Um, so they're kind of two factors you need to be looking out for. Yeah, I think having the goal, it's it, it's you know it's really common sense in my head and your head these days, but like so many people just don't do that and then next week becomes next month and et cetera, et cetera. And then I never end up fucking doing it. Like, no. So that's brilliant. And yeah, just maybe we might reverse a bit then again and dive into what we're talking about injuries and different times of week and life getting in the way, Michelle. Like what are the biggest mistakes you see then with running in general? No matter if it's a 5K or 10K or half marathon training, like what are the biggest mistakes you might see? Like, um, The biggest one is definitely a consistency in week to week running volume. Um, Running, if you're doing something like if you go to a half marathon or full marathon training program, by the end of it, your long runs can take up to three, three hours or four hours, depending on how fast you run of a Saturday or Sunday. And that's a huge commitment, especially for anybody with a family or um, a job that they can't be flexible with. So you see that people often run, as I said before, larger amounts one week and then decrease the next week and then because they know they've done it, the, that running volume, say the week before, they go back to this high running volume. And that's where the injuries begin to occur. So this consistency of running is um, a massive factor in relation to running injuries occurring. Um, other issues that people generally have, people get caught up in things like runners and the type of runners they have and this before they actually have the basics of maybe how to run. Um, there's just there's not strong enough evidence to do with different types of runners and running injury and that. Um, it's basically about finding the type of runners that suit you. So I don't think that's necessarily something you need to get caught up in. Just make sure that the runners you have suit the way you run. Um, so factors like that you can get into people's head very early, where whereas they need to be thinking that they might just need to go out and actually just keep running. Not like keep running for long periods of time, but run on a Monday run again on Wednesday, run on Friday, even if it's one or two K runs, they don't have to be long runs, but you should be running um, and then run the same amount next week or just a gradual increase. This is progressive loading, like what you do in the gym with them with weights and that. Um, You don't just pick up a 50 K deadlift and the next week you go to 70 because you know you did a 50. Um, But people don't do that in the gym, but people do do that when they're running because, oh, I'm out and I feel great. And so I just keep going. But the next day then you're crocked. (laughs) Yeah, and you want to enjoy it too. Running is a lot harder on, yeah, running is a lot harder on the body than people give it credit for, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, I think, even as you're saying it there, a lot of light bulbs are going off in my head in terms of the similarities we can kind of put across to different realms. Like, you know, the runners, nearly, would you say, is this a good analogy for this? Probably, maybe it's a bit too much, but like, runners is kind of like the same thing as people focusing on supplements before they get the calorie balance right when they're trying to lose weight. Yeah, definitely. So people think about um, the gear, the runners, the watches and all that. And that's all great. That all comes in as a package kind of further on. But if you're definitely, if you're going, starting to do your first run, if you want to do your first 10K or first 5K, 
just get yourself a decent program that has uh, progressive increases week to week, maybe a setback week every third week. If it's a longer program you're going for, if it's a half, half marathon or marathon, you're looking for a setback week every third week and where your long run comes back down to a shorter run, things like that. So just actually getting out, getting in the mileage and being consistent with it is more important than um, all the extra kind of stuff yeah. that goes around running. Yeah, and I think the first thing you said as well was they focus on the runners before the actual basics of running, maybe technique in general. Like where, I know it's hard to kind of get this across in a podcast, Michelle, but like where would somebody who has never ran before start with running technique? Is there any like kind of solid takeaways you can give them here? Yeah, the biggest issue with everyone, when it happened to all of us, all of us as well, unless you did athletics when you were younger to a fairly high level, you didn't learn how to run. We all went out to the GA pitch and we all just were running or wherever. Um, and then as we get older now, we're interested in maybe doing 10Ks and half marathons and marathons. And we just know we can run because we went out and we ran when we were younger. Um, it's getting better now in schools and that, so people are getting better. But for people, say, that are our age now that want to do it, things you just need to think of, I guess, are... The whole point in running is to propel yourself forward in general. Um, so any movement you're doing left to right or side to side, that is coming away from your efficiency to move yourself forward. So that's one thing. And you, you notice that a lot if you watch um, marathons and things like that. As they come to the end, you see people sway a lot from side to side, a lot more than they would have at the start of running. So that's something to keep in mind. Other than that, people run very, very differently. And it's hard to tell one person to run one way because if we look at really famous, really good runners like Paula Radcliffe and that, they have very unique running styles, but yet they were still fantastic runners. So it is hard to tell people to run differently um, if they have a certain running method that is working for them. But just be thinking that um, your main focus is to propel yourself forward. You don't want to lose too much energy going side to side or up and down. So you like vertical oscillation, so moving your centre of mass very high or very low. Um, other than that, it's more so especially for a recreational runner, you can't start talking about stride times and stride rates. It just gets too complicated. But things like uh, pacing is a lot easier for people to understand. So if you're doing a half marathon or marathon, um, people tend to go off too fast at the start. So this kind of comes away from technique and more into kind of performance nearly, but people understand it better. So um, don't go off too fast at the start. That will impact your overall race and it leads to people uh, hitting the wall. And it's so easy to do because obviously you're, you're so excited to actually go and do the race. And this will count for a 5K or 10K. You see it the whole time where people tear off at the start and then you overtake them within three kilometers because you can't sustain that pace. Um, in general, women are better at that than men, so we're better at controlling ourselves at the start line than men are, so that's, <laughs> that's good for us. Um, also, consistent pacing throughout leads to better overall performance, so trying to maintain a certain pace, and this is where, like, once you've gotten to that stage where you're doing a race or something, a good watch like come, can come in handy with a GPS that you can look at your pacing. Now, I have one at the moment um, that I'm using, and I it's an absolute godsend and it tells me when I'm going above what I should be or below what I should be yeah. and keeps me in track. Um, and then at the end, you shouldn't be sprinting also. So if you are in sprinting at the end of a half marathon or marathon or 10K, if you're sprinting at the end, then that generally means you've conserved too much energy over the entire race and that you could have actually done the race a lot faster overall. Okay. So they're kind of three key points, I guess, when you get to the race that are more to performance than technique. But if you're talking to recreational runners, technique can get a bit complicated mm. um, and too many key points. Obviously, people lose the mes message then. And what about the thing then where you're here before, like don't run on your heels or run on your toes or this kind of stuff? Where, where would you say or what would your input on that be? So the majority of recreational runners, outdoor runners or distance runners, even if it's 5, 10K, are heel strikers. Um, I would say it's just the way that we are conditioned to run now because we've been running in runners or we're walking in shoes um, the whole time. So when the barefoot trend came in, it's kind of gone away a bit at the moment now. Um, but when that came in, that was all about running on your forefoot. And um, because obviously you couldn't take the loading or the, the impact of the ground when you had no shoes on. Um, so then you would go to the front of your feet to take the impact and lessen your impact on that. So, they kind of said this was associated with less injury risk and people went the way then of, oh, I'll do barefoot running, I'll change my foot strike to forefoot. Um, but unfortunately, that's a six-month at least transition and then people start getting injured straight away with that. So people will run how they run. Um, 
I'm not keen to tell people to run differently in terms of uh, full track if it's working for them. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is about if people start getting injured, then you need to start looking at their technique and maybe small changes um, could prevent this injury from reoccurring, especially if it's an overuse injury. But I would never say to someone if they, they are running 10Ks the whole time on a, a forefoot or a mid, midfoot strike um, to change to heel strike because that's what the majority of people do if they're not injured, if it's not causing them pain. Yeah. I think as well too, especially for, I know we're using examples here of people running like marathons and half marathons, but if we, if we go right back to a beginner level, if somebody can ingrain that kind of pacing in at the start, like not kill themselves even when they're doing their first feckin' day out, maybe they're only doing a 2k jog, but like, just pace themselves so feckin' easy that they enjoy the first few training sessions so they'll keep coming back and I suppose, is it too easy to say this, Mr. But being able to kind of hold yourself proper in a nice, easy run and not be breaking down that you're fucking slogging yourself, like, because you get one person who it might be their first time out. Usually, I see it with the men, like, but they they just push themselves way too hard, um, and they might try to do a five k the first day out as well, which is another mistake. And then they're caving in at the end of it, and you know, even, even though they might be only good doing a, an easy pace compared to yourself, for them it's just way too much. So, like, I think I always say to people as well, like, just Pace yourself easily, like take the fake and run handy, and um, being able to hold yourself proper. And each week, then you're only looking for either an improvement in how you're able to hold a conversation. It's kind of one way we might say to people, like, you know, are you able to do, are you able to get that run done and just about to able to hold a conversation? This is obviously taken away now from a racing kind of format as well. But I'm just looking at it from somebody just kind of getting them into the kind of routine of it more than anything. But um. I suppose what I'm asking is, is saying hold yourself better, is that too simplistic of a term or do you kind of, do you know what I mean by that? No, I, I think that that's a great way to put it because of people, people will associate that with enjoying themselves and uh, being more relaxed maybe. So if that's what you mean by it, then definitely that applies. I guess people need to get out, especially someone so starting off and going to their first 5k, need to get it out of their head that they need to be able to run 5k straight away. As you said, they shouldn't be going out on their first day. Go out on your first day, do 1k and don't do it for time. Just go out. The, the main goal, and it's the main goal, even when you're doing marathon or you're doing 5K, is to go out and get the loading. So we, we talk about loading, about the amount of time that your, your heels hit the ground, about your time spent on your feet. The problem nowadays is that people don't spend enough time on their feet. So when you're going to do running or you have an end goal of doing a 5K, then you need to be going out spending time on your feet. So another good way of doing that is to don't run for distance, run for time. So if you're starting a 5K, instead of being like, I'm going to run 1K, that's putting too much pressure under you and you know, because people know certain times with, with 5K, so people know that they might want to do a 30 minute 5K if it's their first one, they know times associated with good and bad 5Ks but if you say, oh I'm just going to go out and run for 10 minutes, it takes all the pressure off, um, so that is also really, really useful, just saying I'm going to go out and run for a certain amount of time um, and not kind of pay attention to the distance so much. No, that's brilliant I kind of yeah, if more people took it on board, I think they'd just make it more enjoyable for themselves as, as well. Like, like the biggest goal for our members here is we're doing a five k for a bit of fun, a bit of crack, more than anything. Who cares what time you get really in it? Like, it's to get started with something, and just to say you even accomplished that feat in the first place. Obviously, then if somebody's a bit more advanced, they can use kind of even the stuff we've gone through already to maybe improve their running game or whatnot. And um, no, that's brilliant, Michelle. And what about what about the importance of strength training then when it comes to um, running? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it's very important, but I think it's completely overlooked. Um, I think runners can be a bit like swimmers, and this is very general now, in that uh, runners feel like the more time they spend uh, running outside or on the ground is obviously better for performance. Swimmers, the more time they spend in the pool, and therefore like the strength aspect where they're either on land or in the gym can get kind of pushed to the side. Um, anecdotally now at the moment I'm doing a marathon next week, and there's a group of us um, training for it, and I, I'm the only one I think who does gym concurrently with uh, running and I think I'm the only one who hasn't been injured throughout the training program um, so in that way I'm always like go to the gym and even just for a change in scenery even for just for the mind um, when you're out running the whole time it's like running is great it's great for the mind as well but just to be able to change it up and to be able to use different muscles and in different planes of movement. So um, it's very important just for conditioning the body and for just maintaining, trying to keep injury free for the length of time you're training for the run. Definitely, I think it's very important. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like the same with GA over the years too. Like now you see 
kind of more people realizing how important how, how important the strength training side of things is for GA for hurling and for football or whatever like you know and more and more people are kind of catching on to it but I you can see kind of where people get stuck in their ruts over the years too because obviously a runner who just cares about running they don't really care about weights they don't realize the actual benefits they're going to get from it um whether that's simply an injury free benefit or performance benefit they don't realize that the massive kind of knock on effects it can have overall anyway like because even for example we took um one of our guys here loves to run marathons and he's actually kind of stopped him now because he's been literally spent a life of do a marathon injured do a marathon you know he's gone through that cycle of getting back from injury and then training for it again getting back from injury training for it again and um he lives locally like so i'd even see him running on the road and just when you when you know by looking at him you're like his technique could be a bit better, you know. <laughs> but yeah. Anyhow, he started um, with us then a couple of years back, and um, he actually ended up getting injured because he did a marathon at the same time, and he went away for a while, came back a year later, and now he's back consistent. His hips, just his his flexibility has gone through the roof. His technique is better in every way in terms of the gym. And now when I see him running, he's nearly like a professional runner now. Like it's crazy, just how he holds himself and. Just he looks stronger. He looks. Do you know what I mean? Like things are firing better for him and whatnot. But um, that's probably just a very very simplistic way to look at that and the benefits of it for him. Like, but he's he's over the moon now. Like, because he's confident to run without feeling like he's breaking down. He's able to understand his body more because now he trains his body in terms of movements, quality, movement quality with squats and deadlifts and all that kind of stuff. So he understands kind of recovery more and all that kind of fancy stuff as well so he's able to apply that to his running as well and he just he just enjoys the process a lot more now he's not fucking injured every day of the week um so that's brilliant um what was i going to look up to next yeah so we went through can i start basically with maybe a 1k jog or a 2k jog or 2k run for somebody wanting to kind of start maybe a 5k and enjoy it two or three times a week Obviously, as well, you mentioned as well, Michelle, that if somebody was training, I'll use the person for in here, for example, again, they're training here three times a week and they want to do this as a bit of crack outside that, maybe would two days a week get them there? Probably would, like. Um, yeah, yeah, it all depends on your end goal, distance, and obviously your level of fitness um, and your experience um, with kind of body loading exercise. So if you've played a GA your whole life, um, no matter what level, but you're going to do a 5K, then probably doing two runs a week is enough for you. Um, it really just depends on your previous experience. Obviously, the further distance your goal is at the end, so if you want to do a half marathon, full marathon, then you're, you're stepping up to definitely four runs a week um, and cross training. And that does impact the amount of time you can spend in the gym then as well. Of course, of course. Um, but uh, it impacts probably then the quality, not the quality, but um, the loading you can do in the gym and the volume. You're going to have to cut back on doing heavier weights and things like that because you just won't get the recovery time in. Uh, to get the runs in as well um so it is it is definitely a balance and dependent on what you've been done what you've done previously to this goal i'd say yeah and you mentioned as well at the start you kind of threw it out there like five or sign up for the goal in five or six weeks time um you reckon that's a nice time frame for somebody starting from scratch to do a 5k 10k pushing it a bit no yeah yeah um it depends on the level of the person really yeah, yeah. um and the amount of time they dedicated to it at like for so for a full or half marathon you're looking at 18 to 12 weeks so obviously it's coming back and back from that for a 10 5k 5k i think they recommend generally about a six week so 10k maybe an eight week um but again it depends on your starting level yeah okay okay like i'm i'm literally um i'm new to all this stuff too because i don't run like i just run on the, <laughs> on the <hurling> pitch <laughs> that's about it um, yeah. So no, it's good because I'm I'm asking the basic questions that people would I I'd hope people would be asking anyway. Um, and I know we kind of touched on this already, but I, I have a few quick fire questions for you that uh, some of the members threw in, some of our listeners. And one of those was breathing while while running. What's the story with that? Um, breathing while running. Just you, breathe. You should <laughs> definitely recommend that you breathe while running. Yeah. Um, generally, first you're you're going to see, especially for someone going to start in a five k, that the first um the start of each run that they do, um, they're going to struggle. So you, whilst you might want to hold conversation for the rest of the run, at the start you're going to have to wait until your your breathing catches up with your running pace, say. And just because you've now changed from walking to suddenly like a faster movement, so it just takes a bit for, to adjust to it. Um, after that, that just uh, try and be consistent with it. Again, sometimes if you're going to get stitches, maybe you might have to do more deeper breaths, just like 
into the nose, out through the mouth. But it all depends on what kind of pacing you want to do. So I know for some of our runs, we go out and do faster pacing that we, than we were going to do on the day. So that means we're not talking. And obviously, we're focused on our breathing a lot more. But then for our slower, long runs, we're chatting um, again. So it just depends on what run you're doing and what pace you want to go at. Okay. And... Yeah, we touched on this already as well, but footwear for running was another question. Where, like, people obviously have in their heads that footwear is massive. So, like, wh- what would you even say them to do when it comes to footwear? Um, yeah, it really is trial and error with footwear. Um, if you don't wear minimalist runners um, or runners that have less cushioning, say, on them, just have a look at what you wear on a day-to-day basis, then do not buy them for going out and training. That There's a massive ad- adaptation period between going from a cushioned runner to a, a a barefoot style runner or like um a Nike free or something that's a lot more lightweight. Um so you you will find that your calves are going to be like rocks the next day if you go out and do even a one K or two K jog on a, a lightweight runner. Um other than that there is some research that says that if you have um different pairs of runners and you wear them like parallel for different runs during a training program that this can actually maybe lead to a decrease in running related injuries because you're then uh, kind of loading different muscles from day to day but the research isn't consistent on it and what type of runner is good for anyone it tends to be a mixture of um, preferred movement patterns so any runner I put on I'm going to move my legs in the same pattern regardless because I have this preferred movement pattern say um, my shins are going to move in the same direction same distance no matter what but the other factor that comes into me choosing a runner is my comfort filter so um, I therefore then choose runners that I find most comfortable and this helps to offset uh, running injury occurrence, if that makes sense. So no matter what runner I wear, I'm going to kind of move in a certain movement pattern. But I'm also, I have a filter in built to me that says I'm going to wear those that are the most comfortable um, and that's why I choose them. Then that tries to offset injury as well. So it really is going to be, unfortunately, trial and error. But I just find it great to talk to other people who are running and see what brands they've gone with or what runners they really recommend it's not going to be the same for everyone but it also is a good indicator that you don't want to waste uh, 50 euro on a pair of runners that like someone already had and they just thought they were they did they fell apart they didn't last the amount of time and they just weren't comfortable things like that yeah i think one thing that i used to have is i used to, I used to run when i kind of when i wasn't hurling like a few years back um we used to do a few mud runs and whatnot and did a few random 5k's on the place for charities and I used to use like a Nike free, but I thought my foot was just like just swaying way too much in the actual shoe. It wasn't it wasn't tight on my foot. So back then I changed it out to one of those New Balance um, runners that have a minimalist kind of sole in them. And I was I was I was in bits for weeks when I first brought it into play because it was totally new for me. But then I started using them in the gym. I started training with very very minimal shoes. And even now, like I wear a runner every day. But then if I'm training, I put on like a hard sole shoe. And obviously then when I'm hurling, I wear the hurling boot. But if I do go for a run once in a blue moon, like now we're not hurling this period, like I'm with a few runs, 5Ks coming up with the members, I will put back on that minimum shoe because it's just what I'm used to. Like, and I enjoy, I enjoy wearing it now. Like, um, But then the question, just based on what you said there, Michelle, like would that be, am I being silly doing that? Like if I run, if I run mainly in a hurling boot and then I go to a minimum shoe, have you seen anything with that before? Or is it just kind of preference? Um, you're not going to the distance you're running for the amount of time you're running you're not probably going to do damage yourself but okay. you could just be sore you might just find that your calves are like way tighter and you figure out what kind of running pattern then you run in so are you more forefoot then when you run if you do a 5k the next day in your minimalist runners you're probably running more towards the front of your foot yeah. that's a guess now but as you said you are conditioned more so to a minimalist shoe so when I did my undergrad I did my um dissertation or thesis on uh people who wore do you remember five five and five fingers i nearly bought a pair yeah um, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so they yeah they were big at the time um and then i put them these people i asked them to wear their normal runners the five and five fingers and barefoot i think looking at it um and there wasn't that much difference between now these people were conditioned they wore five and five fingers and they trained barefoot so these people who were well conditioned and had gone through kind of a six-month period there were more than that even um and i didn't see any significant difference i don't think between uh, some of the variables I was looking at in the, the minimalist condition and their running runner, which would have been a cushioned kind of generic running shoe. Um, so they're conditioned to it. So you don't, you might be conditioned to it and you might be able to get through it. But for anybody else, I'd be saying get a get a fairly decent runner. Um, 
something with a bit of cushion. Just don't get anything that's too minimalist um, because you're just not used to it. It'll just that you won't have come around to the adaption period and you'll just be a bit sore the next day. Yeah. And that's I, what puts people off running then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, yeah. They get so sore. And then, but then I, I find there's another side of it too. Like people go for a run for the first time and they're so sore after it. They think it's like, in turn, like basic, uh, this is based on like from a fat loss and muscle gain perspective now. They think that because they're so sore, that, oh my God, this is great for my muscles because I'm so sore. This must be better than training in the gym. And it's just because you haven't worked those muscles in that way before. Your body's like, what the fuck are you doing to me? I need to go away and repair and recover now. So no, you're dead right there. And with the shoe for myself, yeah, I don't like, I, hurling is my sport. I don't, I wouldn't probably bother doing that over it. Like we're doing an AK Tough Mudder in um, July and there is a double, there is a 16K option, but just doesn't appeal to me, so I'm just gonna, <laughs> just gonna stick with the AK. Someday, someday. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we're gonna transition away from that. I think we'll do a little recap, Michelle, in a couple of minutes' time because there's a lot of information there I want to kind of glue together to remind people what the main kind of key takeaways are, which is brilliant. But right now, I want to talk about breasts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you often <laughs> <I can> say that. <laughs> Where, yeah, look, I suppose, tell me a bit about the research you've done to this, and I suppose then we might, we might find some questions there from there, because, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what to ask you on this. Yeah, no worries. Uh, it's a bit of a different topic. So I'll just, I'll give you a bit of background to what we do here. So we are the research group in breast health, and uh, we are one of the world leading groups that kind of looks at uh, breast movement, we look at breast pain, breast education, um, a lot around sport and movement. Um, the development of kind of sporting garments, um, to sports bras and that, um, and our overall aims improve quality of life for women. And the area that we look at obviously then is breasts. Um, so on a day to day basis here, we do a lot of testing of sports bras. So we're kind of a big test house for all, a lot of major brands because obviously women are spending a lot of money on sports bras um, to try and increase sporting performance or decrease pain during sport and exercise. And I guess companies are aware that they should be providing a good product as well as that. Um, so we do a lot about that. Um, other things, I guess, just, yeah, just increasing quality of life for women by just helping them with breast support. That's our main, our main issue here. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. Yeah, so like, Sport, sports bras and I always just assume like sports bras are just for comfort um, more than anything but they're obviously for pain reduction um, comfort and probably the whole other host of factors you just mentioned there like but what about them Michelle I suppose you go to pennies and you buy a sports bra there versus you buy a Nike or an Under Armour or you know a better quality brand like is there massive differences there in those for people like in terms of what it's meant to do yeah, I think I think people presume that um, that the more you pay, the better you get a pr- better product you're getting, and the more effective it will be. So it will increase your support, decrease any pain, increase performance. Um, but there, we don't have the research to back that up. Uh, we don't have any research that says, says that um, this product cost this much and it, it was it performed a lot better. Uh, we have seen some high street sports bras which perform really well as well so the thing is with a sports bra when you're going to pick one out um you're looking for a really good fit um so all the breast tissue should be within the sports bra the straps should fit right it should feel comfortable because people won't wear it if it's not comfortable and we do see um a lot of uh, the female population still does not wear a sports bra when exercising um despite the the fact that we think that it should be one of your key uh, piece of equipment in your gym bag along with everything else you have. People will always think about runners and running tights or your sports vest, but sports bra should be in there along with it. Um, as well as that, you just need to make sure that you're buying one right for the activity you're doing. So if you're going to do something like yoga, you probably only need like a low support bra. Um, but if you're going to do running or if you're going to do a hit class or something that involves the plyometrics, you're looking for a high support bra. Um, so don't be wearing the same sports bra you wear to yoga to do a hit class. Um, it just it won't function the same. You won't be as comfortable probably. Um, and in the long term, you could actually do damage to your breast. So if you have a size uh, G cup, which would be termed as a large breast, um, and you're not wearing the right support 
support in the long term um, you could actually be doing damage to your breast because skin is the primary support system of the breast and your skin can only take so much tension before it begins to get damaged. So just protect yourself in the long run as well. Just make sure you're well equipped for whatever exercise you're going to do. But that doesn't necessarily mean buying the most expensive one. It means just getting one that suits the exercise you're doing, that fits you well and that's comfortable. Okay, no interest. Yeah, so low, acti- low activity or less kind of like jumping, jumping style stuff you just need a low support bra and then for uh, stuff where you might be doing more jumpy style stuff, burpees, plyometrics, etc. Uh, maybe even some basic strength training maybe. Is, is there a medium kind of range? Is it just low and high or can you get like medium support? No, you can definitely get medium. Um, I'm not sure what sports they're targeted at more so because obviously we know low and high is a lot easier to classify low and high sports because what you might classify the medium sport if I go... Uh, full out and put a load of effort into it that's a high impact sport for me do you know that can I um, so we, yeah we, just make sure you're picking the right one yeah because we mix a lot of like a lot of our strength training we have metabolic kind of conditioning components near the end of the sessions within that across the week and so out of three three sessions a week three or four sessions a week two of them could be very very um, plyometric style if you like jumpy like and whatnot. whereas but within that session maybe only 70% of the, or 30% of the session is involved with that. So would they be better off using a high support bra for that because of that 30% kind of jump at the end, if you like? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, use the higher level bra for, even if you're going to be 10 minutes of your activity, go with the high support bra. Okay. And um, yeah. you'll be more comfortable. And um, like for women with larger breasts, even things like embarrassment come into it. Um, and that, and you'll, you'll feel more assured going into the exercise that you're kind of covering all bases. Um, so definitely go for the high support in that case, yeah. And then running is obviously high support to them as well. Yeah, running is high support and then there are other factors that come into it. Running, running gets obviously a bit more complicated because for the amount of time you're running, uh, different issues can occur. So for running, you're probably looking, you might want to look more into the bra, uh, all the things I said beforehand, but then you've got maybe sweat wicking. Um, so if you're going out for a three hour run, you're going to want something that's going to remove sweat away as well. Um, we we actually talk to a lot of women who get um, chafing underneath their breasts from the underband. So some people like a very tight underband when they're running. Some people prefer it a bit looser, but you're risking um, chafing. So then the big thing if you're going to do any kind of race is to make sure you try out your sports bra in a fairly long run that's kind of in line with the run you're doing. So if you're doing a half marathon or 10K, make sure you wear your sports bra on a few training runs before that because on the day you don't really want to rock up and have some bra that's like tearing you to shreds for three hours. <laughs> yeah. Won't be comfortable. But that's probably mainly only an issue if you are doing marathons, kind of half marathons, would it be? Uh, no, it definitely, we've seen it with women doing 5Ks and charter runs as well okay. because if they're not wearing um, a sports bra that necessarily fits them right or even things like tags, Things as simple as that are seamed. Mm. Um, so it's definitely uh, it's something that you should be training with the whole time as well. Okay, brilliant. So I think that answers my uh, breast ask question. Anyway, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, that's brilliant, Michelle. I've actually learned some quite some stuff there myself. And um, it's interesting to see, though, that you said that not enough ladies wear sports bras. That's a big, that's a fucking, that's a big eye opener. Like, um, no, wow, brilliant. Okay. It, yeah, it's crazy. Did you want to pop something in there? Yeah, just that you'll see yourself um, any for any uh, woman if they go and watch a local like or local race. Um, we see it on the sea frontier, um, and it's very obvious that a lot, a lot of women aren't wearing either the correct sport or they're wearing like everyday bras to do. Uh, running tends to be the one because people can just pick it up, and running is a free sport you can do outside. So people just do it and do it after work or something like that and then don't have sports bra. Um, but definitely you should be wearing sports bra for all exercise activities. And I know as well at the start, like you were saying, people get too focused on the gear they use and the runners they use. But for like, for if you're training in the gym, if you're going for a run, I think it's nice to kind of treat yourself to a nice bit of gear or two to have because it's, you know, for people that don't play a sport, that is technically their sport. Like for, like for a lot of our members here that maybe have played GA in the past and maybe they've done nothing, but now they're in the gym. That's almost like their sporting thing to do. So I think it's nice for them to get, you know, invest, invest in a nice bit of gear too down, down the line, obviously when they get everything in order and whatnot and, to kind of enjoy wearing those things and kind of, do you know what I mean? Like, does that make sense? It's just kind of, um, I don't know. 
kind of a little bit of enjoyment comes along with that, I think, as well. Down the line, obviously, we'll, we're not losing sight of the basics here either. Like, yeah, definitely getting um, nice gear that you like, that you drive, and that you feel confident in is perfect. That's great for motivation, for getting you exercise and, and having you enjoy exercise. I'd only be saying it from more of a running prevention or a injury prevention um aspect for running especially people get caught up in that um or they've been told they over pronate or they need this kind of runner that kind of runner and this will stop them getting injured i just think that's too much of focus when you haven't even gone out and yeah kind of done maybe a bit of a 1k and you don't know how you run or you don't know if you're able to do this type of running and things like that and so definitely from a motivation aspect i totally get that i feel way better going into the gym when i've nice new leggings or a new top, whatever. Um, but from a running injury prevention, um, just be looking at how much you're running. Have a decent pair of runners, but don't get too caught up in um, too caught up in it all because it can be a lot of information as well. Yeah. And it can overwhelm you. Yeah, overwhelm you. No, but above all, ladies, anyway, just invest in sports cars is probably the biggest takeaway from that. Um, and Michelle, what does your own current training look like across the week now for the marathon? Um, so we are tapering now. We've been tapering for the last three weeks. So we have a breeze week now. This week, my long run is 13K, whereas whatever, two or three weeks ago, it was 32K. So um, at the moment, first, so I did um, an 18 week program, four runs a week. Um, generally, started off with shorter runs and one long run at the weekend. Uh, it was, it generally progressed to the long run, then got longer and longer, and with a step back week every third week. So if I did, up to 22k maybe on week three or week two i'd go back to 18k the next week things like that um and then with that i've had to step back on how much weight i can do in the gym unfortunately and which can be demoralizing especially when i go back to the gym after the marathon i'm gonna be like i'm so weak but i know it'll come back um but it's just because i can't get the recovery time if i do deadlifts and then try and go out and do a even if it's only a 12 or 13k the next day or whatever i just my recovery time is just crap i can't um, function the next day so yeah I've been doing a good bit of a lot of stretching um, a lot of single leg work and that just because I have a kind of a dodgy ankle anyway from playing soccer years ago so just injury prevention a lot of injury prevention stuff in the gym a lot of stretching foam rolling um, and then every so often I'll throw in like a spin session or something just for my mind just to get a good sweat on or that um but now the next the last few weeks have been good with tapering it's a lot more interesting because if i've only this week i'd only um two six and a half k's a 5k and a 13k so for the 5k yesterday i did like a warm-up and then i did uh five one k's at four minute kilometers you know a faster kind of interval session so that was a bit more interesting than just going out and running a 5k or whatever um yeah so it's good it's a balance and the days that i feel broke up i just don't go to the gym same as probably what you have with the guys inside you have to listen to your body as well do you know that kind of way yeah well your goal is very about injury prevention now yeah well your goal is super specific now like you're you know and that's yeah things need to change temporarily for that and obviously the gym side of things is going to take a hit because you're running a fucking marathon you're not you're not trying to build muscle as such at the moment like you know um Ah, yeah, but your 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 strength will come back quick after. But it's no, it's interesting that you mentioned as well how you have a pullback week every third week. Um, sort of the misconception people have that just think when they start running, it's just like, oh, I'll just do more and more and more and more and more and more. In a years time, I'll be running fucking five k's, ten k's out from my ears. Like it's not you, your body just can't keep going. Like and there has to be periods where you're backing off and whatnot. And you're doing a three week taper now. Like it's just and just for people that don't know what a, even what a taper is, Michelle. Like, what, could you just maybe explain the very very basic elements of a taper? Yeah, um, so basically it just means in the kind of leading weeks up to your goal, you reduce the volume. Um, it's a kind of a way to get you prepared for everything um, and just injury prevention wise and because you've already hit the requirements for your training program maybe. So um, for the likes of us doing a marathon, which is 42K, we'll never ever get to that distance when we're training for it. Um, so the, the longest run we ever did was 32 and then we tapered down so then our long runs became progressively shorter I think we were on 19k and then 18k and now we're down to 13k um, every Saturday or Sunday and then the runs during the week have also got shorter so they would have generally been 8 and 10k's during the week um, but they're now down to 5 and 6k's and next week uh, our run is Saturday week and next week I think I have like a 3k um, a 5k and then the marathon or something so it just means that you You've kind of done your training, so you're progressively just decreasing the amount you're doing so that you're fresh for the day, basically. Yeah, interesting. 
It's a lot of running. <laughs> <laughs> You'd love it. I don't think so. <laughs> um, okay, so just a, a quick recap. Maybe correct me now if I'm wrong with any of these things, but just for somebody who's starting off from scratch, you mentioned 1K jog or maybe even a 2K run to start with two or three times a week and then obviously build it up over the six weeks to kind of start hitting your 5Ks and then do your 5K race or run or just enjoy the fucking thing. Um, don't worry about runners, that kind of stuff at the start. Find something that you enjoy, you don't feel like you've kind of any awkward pains in and you're, they're comfortable for you while running. And um, moving forward, pacing yourself with two big key points you have with technique and looking at the time on your feet you do across the week and staying consistent with that is kind of a, another big one. But they're, um, they're very easy takeaways people can do. It's, just, it's a matter of getting out and fucking doing it. Like, and I suppose one thing that we haven't touched on is you, you mentioned super basic, like starting somebody with that 1K jog their first week and maybe into a 2K um, from there. Like how, obviously, it, it depends on the person, Michelle. Like, but how fast would you try and get up to a 5K if they're running a 5K in six weeks? Like generally, what, what, would, it, what would it entail? Like would you go from 2K week one to three to four to five or would you go two to four week two or do you know is there any kind of general rule of thumb you could do i know it's all individual but is there any guidelines for that um god off the top of my head i don't know what kind of progression they do now i'd say it's fairly slow and you're probably like your, your run long runs generally because you're building up to five years your long runs are probably only progressing by maybe 500 meters you know like yeah. you might go from 2k to two and a half k and that but I, i'd imagine built into them they probably have have 800 meter sessions and things like that and not like what we know of 800 meter sessions like really fast pace whatever um but maybe uh, 800 meters by three times at whatever pace things like that um but yeah it would be a fairly slow progression um or it would be a fairly small distance progression because it's kind of a reduced distance your end goal is and because you've got the six weeks um yeah so i'm not sure off the top of my head but i'd imagine it would be a small progressions over the weeks and if you're running twice a week one of those have that like a longer style run and have another one a short style run is that what you're kind of getting at there yeah 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 i'd be aiming um for probably three times a week to get out running again this just get the time on your feet so that you're more so getting used to that and that your body's getting used to the loading um just getting that force up to your heels and things like that um so you'd be looking at um one longer run and then the rest can be shorter runs so if you're doing three you could do one longer run one shorter run and then one interval type session you know if it was just kind of shorter runs broke up with time and things like that nice nice yeah don't do the don't do the thing that i did a few years back when i hadn't ran in about a year and we went out and we did a 12k mud run up in hell and back and my calves um, cramp, yeah. my calves cramping at, at AK and I it took me about 15 minutes just to get back to normal so I could finish it out <laughs> so yeah that um, happens so often because people know they have it in them to go out and run it yeah yeah. And so they just pick it up and go back out but that's that's how people get injured really like. yeah well if I was doing that long term now I could see definitely Jesus yeah I'd be, I'd be gone yeah. but uh, that, that was only once a year <laughs> anyhow then um Michelle, is there anything else to add to that then? Are you happy with everything else you've covered there? Um, what was the other thing? Oh, just the other thing. The reason people stop running is primarily because, well, one is time, but the second is injury. And so there are certain things, um, like there's so much research that goes into why do certain groups of people get injured or what cause, what are the correlations between something happening and getting injured. So for recreational runners, big ones to watch out are, um, how much previous exercise you have done. So if you didn't exercise, never played GA or whatever, and now you're going to start up and uh, do a 10K and your running volume is going to increase dramatically, you're more likely to get injured. Uh, so time spent on your feet. Or if you were a swimmer or something where you're not necessarily body loading and then you go to running again, you haven't been doing previous body loading exercise, so you're more increased to be injured. Um, BMI, unfortunately, is uh, linked with uh, increased risk of injury. So the higher your BMI is, so obviously um, to combat this, if you can decrease your BMI before you start going into a running program for a run, um, which might be what kind of what your guys are doing in the gym as well. Um, if that's kind of around their goals, that'd be good. That'll decrease your risk of injury. Um, other than that, uh, male and female, no, there's not much between those. So <laughs> I can't tell your, your women that they're less likely to get injured or anything 
anything like that. It's not going to help them. But and they're the, they're the kind of big ones. Just get on your feet, and if you can decrease your BMI, that'll decrease your risk of injury before you go out run. Yes, and I suppose to round that off as well, it's you you just said it there. Like if you have a high BMI, running is gonna not going to be the best thing for fat loss. Like we know we already know this anyway in the science and whatnot, but. Yeah, get your body get your body weight down first, and then if you want to look at kind of running outside that, kind of you can use it to complement what you're doing in the gym if you like. And that's kind of that's the way we focus here. And look at it's um, it's it's what works essentially, and it's what's it's, it's what's it's what's grounded in the research like as well. Running for muscle gain and fat loss is not the way to go. But this podcast was not about fat loss and running or fat loss as such. It's more so about the performance side of it and enjoying it along the way. So, no, brilliant, Michelle, and thank you for that. Yeah, I suppose best to look with the uh, marathon next, next week, is it? Yeah, yeah, Sunday week. We go off to Edinburgh to Forest Inns. Brilliant. Um, but it is the fastest and flattest course in the UK, so <laughs> hopefully nice. we pick the right one. <laughs> nice, nice, no, brilliant. And, Michelle, is there anywhere you'd like to give the listeners um, a chance to maybe follow you a bit more or your research or anything like that kind of stuff? Is there any links you want me to share in the show notes? Um, if they're looking for any information, I guess, on sports bras and that, we're the research group in breast health. So we're, um, we have a lot of stuff up on our website, go through the University of Portsmouth. Um, we have a Twitter account as well. Um, other than that, my research is on ResearchGate um, or Google Scholar. Always a good one if they're looking for any of the research that I do. Cool. Yeah, I'll get those links off you anyway, and we can put them up in the show notes page. Um, no, that's brilliant. Michelle, I'll definitely probably get you back on in the future because I just realized as well there's so many other there's so many other avenues we can kind of go. We can maybe talk a bit more about advanced marathon stuff in the future. We could even dive into touch on some fat loss stuff and running and that kind of crack as well. But I think we've covered nearly all of it here. Anyway. Um, but no, Michelle, that was brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on and best of luck with the marathon. No worries, thanks for having me and hopefully there'll be loads more female guests now you'll have on. Yes, you exactly. started it. You've started it, you've started it. <laughs> <laughs> as I was saying as well. I, I God, to... I know a lot of great female scientists. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. But I was saying as well, like any anytime I ever give out suggestions or if people want to give suggestions for the podcast, uh, questions or who to have on, it's always males giving like male related stuff or wanting to get on male guests. So I'm, I'm asking now actively for the ladies to come on because it was only... It was only um, a lady actually gone through Instagram and said, why don't you have any female guests on? And I was like, Jesus, I actually haven't had any female guests on yet. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where it's came from. No, you had to get uh, called out to do it. Yeah, but I think <laughs> me and you were chatting with this a few months back when we were, when we were talking about first coming on. It was, it was just simply because my kind of immediate kind of friends for podcasts and that kind of stuff were males. And it's not that I've done a lot of spite and that kind of crack. So um, no, Michelle, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And we shall chat to you soon. No worries. So guys, that was Michelle and you can find the show notes for this episode over at Doc Fitness Online forward slash episode 17 and there's no spaces in that, it's just episode 17 and all the one word. And here's one thing I need to get a bit better at asking for at the end of these episodes is if you're on, if you're listening to this on iTunes, if you're subscribed on iTunes or if you're subscribed on Android, which is Stitcher um, or whatever podcast platform you're on, if you have the ability to leave a review on it, I would be forever grateful if you would do that. Because more reviews and ratings, which means more people are going to see it, which means it'll be ranked higher and whatnot. And I want to kind of spread this podcast as much as I can to get into the ears of people that need to hear it and the people that we want to hear it like. But I know as somebody who listens to podcasts myself, I'm never really spurred to leave a review because it's time consuming. You have to actually physically go in and write, click a few buttons and write it down. I know it sounds easy, but it's still, people just don't bother to do it. If you do leave me a review on iTunes or on Stitcher, what I want you to do is I want you to, once you do it, I want you to leave me an email at info at docfitnessonline.com and I will offer you one week's free coaching just for leaving that review. I don't even know how I'm going to figure out how to do the one week's free coaching yet, but uh, if you do leave that review, just as a little thank you, I'll offer you that for one week free coaching and we'll figure things out from there. So guys, hopefully this podcast was helpful. I know I've actually taken away a lot from myself from somebody who doesn't really come from a running background, only, only playing sport really. I don't actually... We don't actually coach clients on running here in Doc Fitness. We only do it for a bit of fun outside the gym. So that was great to get the insight into that. And um, hopefully you've taken away a lot too. So until next time, chat to you soon.